Hello and welcome to the chapter 13 assignment. I'm actually going to do two problems for you. Problem number one, which is the chi-squared goodness of fit test, and problem number five, which is the chi-squared test of independence. So let's begin, and we'll do this in Excel as usual. Um, here's problem number one. The shares of the U.S. automobile market held in 1990 by those companies were 34%, 32%, 19%, 9%, and 6%. So suppose that a new survey of 1,000 new car buyers so shows the following purchase frequencies. Boom. So let's get this in Excel right now. So this is what we, that's our population, that's our hypothesized values. So hypothe values. Zero point three four, zero point three two, zero point one nine, zero point oh nine, zero point oh six. Here's what we observed. Well that didn't copy too well. Let's try it again. Hmm. Sometimes picking up a more than just the table helps. There we go. There's the table. You can delete everything else. Now remember n equals a thousand. Because it's a thousand new car buyer survey. So this is the hypothesized percentages, not the hypothesized counts. You should always use hypothesized counts. So this is going to be equal to that sample size of 1,000 times our hypothesized percentage, 340. Now we can just copy that formula to the left. Let's go ahead and make everything centered. There we go. So this is observed. This is expected. So far, so good. The requirement in order to use the chi-squared goodness of fit test is that each expected value is at least 5. Is that true in this case? It is true. The smallest expected value is 60, which is much more than 5. So we're good to go. Now to determine whether the current market shares differ from those in 1990, we use alpha 0.05. We need to calculate the test statistic. Test statistic is just the sum of the differences squared divided by the expected. So for th here, this is going to be equal to, open parentheses, 397 minus 340 to the power of 2, which is squaring, divided by 340. So the contribution of General Motors to the total chi-squared statistic, which we're about ready to calculate, is 9.55588. Copy and paste, copy and paste, etc. So the chi-squared test statistic is just equal to the sum of all of those components. 43.2925. That is our test statistic. Round to three decimal places. I'll have Excel do that for me. Seems like rounding a five would round up, but it's really four nine. Forty three point two nine two. That's the value of the test statistic. We can either calculate the p-value from this, or we can calculate the critical value corresponding to alpha equals 0.05 and degrees of freedom equal to 5 minus 1. So here's the CV. This is equal to C-H-I-S-Q, that's typical uh, abbreviation for chi-squared, 
dot inv because we're calculating the critical value so it's we're giving this function a probability and we want it to give us a chi-squared value dot rt because we're going to be looking at the right tail 0 0.05 degrees of freedom is going to be n minus 1 or the number of groups minus 1 1 2 3 4 5 minus 1 is 4 critical value is 9.48773 what we observed is greater than that therefore we reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is what we observe comes from this hypothesized distribution we reject that there has been a change since 1990 similarly we can calculate a p-value p-value remember is just a probability a probability so it's going to be remember chi-squared chisq dot dist because it's a probability and since we care about the right tail of the chi-squared distribution it's going to be dot rt what information do we give it? we give it the observed test statistic and the degrees of freedom again n minus 1 4 in this case p-value is 9 times 10 to the negative ninth both of those tell us that we should reject the null hypothesis so let's go back so we reject conclude market shares differ from those of 1990 the null hypothesis was there was no difference null means zero so null hypothesis is there's no difference. We rejected that, so there is a difference. That's problem number one. Here's how we would do this in Excel. What we observe, what we would expect if the hypothesized distribution is true. Chi-squared statistic is just made up of observed minus expected squared divided by expected add it up to give the total chi-squared test statistic. And then we can either compare that to the critical value using chi-sc.inv.rt or we can compare it to the p-value using chi-sc.dist.rt. Dot dist gives us probabilities. Dot inv gives us critical values. So that's problem number one. And now for problem five. Problem one was chi-squared test, uh, chi-squared goodness of fit test. Problem number five is chi-squared test of independence. And we know it's going to be a chi-squared test of independence because we're comparing two categorical variables. In this example, one categorical variable is smokerness, and the other categorical variable is on-the-job accident. The smoker variable has three levels: heavy, moderate, non-smoker. The on-the-job accident variable has two levels, yes and no. In this sample of 66 people, 11 were heavy smokers that had an on-the-job accident. Six were moderate smokers that did not have an on-the-job accident. 34 people had an on-the-job accident. 33 were non-smokers. So let's get this into Excel, see what we can do with it. How did they get these row totals? Well, let's go ahead and delete the row totals and the column totals and see if we can recreate them. Column total is just equal to the sum of that column, 34. Row, uh, column total is for here. Just, oops, just copy that formula, move it over, 32. Row total is equal just to the sum of that row. 11 plus 8 gives you 19. Now we can copy that down. 66 is our sample size. So that's how they got those values in the, in the marginals. 
These are also called marginal probabilities or marginal counts, uh, row marginal, column marginal, etc. OK, so we got the data into Excel. First thing we need to do is to calculate the, prob uh, the percents for each of the rows and each of the columns. So the row total, the percent for that is just going to be equal to that 19 divided by the total sample size of 66. And copy down. This column percent is just going to be equal to what we observe, again, 34, divided by the total sample size, 66. So let's put those numbers in. Row 1 is 28. We've got to round it to two decimal places. 28.79%. Row 2 is 21.21%. Row 3 is 50%. Column 1 is 51.52%. And column 2 is 48.49%. Where did we get those? Well, we could actually change that into a percent. We've got to make it to two decimal places. 51.52% for column yes. 51.52% for column 1. So we can have Excel do all of that work for us. 28.79, 21.21, 50, 51, 52, and 48, 48. Mm, something happened there. Oh yeah, what happened is I have trouble rounding. So it's 48.48. Boom. Good thing we have Excel check our work. B. Now we have to calculate cell percents. The cell vo uh, box is for that cell count divided by the total sample size. The row is the cell count divided by the row count. And the column is the cell count divided by the column count. So cell for heavy is 11. 11 divided by 66. Tell you what, let's just go ahead and copy this table again. Do some cleaning up. Make sure I can use the mouse. So it's going this in the cell is going to be eleven divided by sixty six. I believe we still need to round to two decimal places. Yeah, that's redundant. So for heavy, yes, it's 16.67. For heavy, no, it's 12.12. .12. For moderate, yes, it's also 12.12. .12. For moderate, no, 9.09. .09. For non-smoker, yes, it's 22.73. For non-smoker, no, 27.27. .27. So the cell percents are going to be the cell counts divided by the total. The row percents are going to be the cell counts divided by the row totals. So instead of dividing this by 66, this will be divided by 19. Instead of dividing this one by 66, since there's 14 moderate smokers, we're going to divide by 14. Instead of dividing this one by 66, we're going to divide it by 33. And 
I'll do the same thing here. 58 .58.9, 55.14, 45.45, 42.11, 42.86, 54.55. Notice this percent for heavy yes plus this percent for heavy no adds up to 100 because we're dividing by the row sum. So the row percentages have to add up to 100. OK, let's transfer those numbers over. And there they are. So again, the row percents are the cell counts divided by the row totals. Similarly, the column percents for the cell will be the cell count divided by the column total. Let's go ahead and do that one. So this is going to be equal to 11 divided by the column total of 34. Similarly, this one will be 8 divided by 34, and this one's 44, I mean 15 divided by 34. Notice that these add up to 100% because we're looking at column percentages. So just as these three counts add up to the column count, these three percents have to equal to the total column percent, which is 100%. So similarly, this will be 8 divided by 32, because the total number of no's was 32. Copy and paste. And we now have our cell percents within the columns. Let's transfer those over. And again, notice these add up to 100%. These add up to 100%. So here we go. What do these numbers actually mean? Let's look at this number right now. This number means, given that the person had an accident, the probability that they were a non-smoker was 44.12%. Column percents, remember, add up to 100. It's because you're saying, OK, given that yes is the correct, what are the individual probabilities? So this 18.75 is the probability that a person is a moderate smoker given that they had no accident. Hmm. Maybe we should review conditional probability. Go back to our book, read through it, look at our notes, and say, oh, we've talked about these things already. The 57.89, that's a row. So given that the person is a heavy smoker, what's the probability they had an accident? 57.89%. Given that the person is a heavy smoker, what's the probability they had no accident? 42.11%. Given that the person is a non-smoker, what's the probability they had an accident? 45.45%. So the row probabilities or percentages are conditioned on the row level. The column percentages are conditioned on the column level. And the cell percentages are read as 16.67% of the people in the study were heavy smokers who had an accident. It's an and. It's, it's the intersection. 25% of the people in the study, whoops, nope, that's a column, sorry hit the wrong thing. 9.09% .09 of the people were moderate smokers and had no accident. Notice the cells are the intersections, the ands. The rows and the columns are conditional. The row is conditional on the smoker level. The column is conditional on the accidentness. So that 25%, given the person had no accident, it's 25% chance he was a heavy smoker. OK. Now, using the mini-tab outputs, test hypothesis that the incidence of on-the-job accidents is independent. Alpha is 0.01. Here's the mini-tab output. There's the p-value. p-value greater than alpha. Fail to reject the null hypothesis. p-value greater than alpha. Fail to reject the null hypothesis. Do not reject. Now we interpret that do not reject. 
Is there a difference in on the job accident occurrences between smokers and non smokers? We do not reject the null hypothesis. We therefore conclude that there is no difference. If we rejected, that means we found a difference. Since we since the null hypothesis is the two variables, the two categorical variables are independent, that means that there is no difference in the distribution of accidents according to smoker level. So, no difference. Now, let's take a little side trip here. How did Minitab get these values? The chi-squared statistic, the degrees of freedom, and the resulting p-value. Well, the degrees of freedom is just the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. The number of rows is 3. 3 minus 1 is 2. The number of columns is 2. 2 minus 1 is 1. 2 times 1 gives us that degrees of freedom. Rows minus 1 times columns minus 1. Chi-squared test statistic. Let's go ahead and do this in Excel. So here's the original data. I just copied it over, made it a little bit tidier. Uh, it's exactly the same as what we've been working with, just different format. This is what we observed. This is the observed table. So I'm going to put OBS here. The second, the table that we have to create is the expected table. Expected table is also going to be a yes and a no. Also going to be heavy, moderate, and none. I guess that should be none. Tidy this up a little bit more. Okay, so this is the expected. This is the observed. What number goes right there? What is the expected number of heavy smokers who've had an accident? We observed 11. What is this expected value, though? This expected value is generated by the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that these two distributions are independent. Remember one of the I think that's how you spell independent. One of the definitions of independent was that two events, A and B, are independent if the probability of their intersection was equal to the product of their individual probabilities. So if they're independent, then the probability of A intersect B is probability of A times probability of B. If the yes no is independent of heavy, moderate, non, then what goes in there is just the count for A intersect B. What is the count for A, A intersect B? It's going to be the probability of A intersect B times the sample size. The count is the probability times the sample size. Well, what is the probability of A and what is the probability of B? Heavy? is 19, 11 plus 8, over 65. B, yes, is 19, 29, 34, over 65. So this is going to equal 19 divided by, sorry, it was 66, I believe. That's P of A times P of B which is 11 plus 8 plus 15, 34, over the sample size of 66. So that's P of A times P of B. Now we just multiply it by the total sample size, 66. So if the two variables are indeed independent, the expected number of people who are heavy smokers and who have had an accident is 9.7878. Let's go ahead and do that for moderate. So this is equal to 8 plus 6, it's a probability of moderate, 8 over 8 plus 6, 
I'm sorry, 8 plus 6, which is 14, divided by the sample size, times this 11 plus 8 plus 15, 34, divided by the sample size, and then that thing multiplied by the sample size. So if the two variables are indeed independent, we would expect moderate smokers who have been in an accident to be 7.212121. So what is non? It's going to be 33 out of 66 times 34 over 66 times 66. 33 over 66, 15 plus 18. 34, 11 plus 8 plus 15 over, 30, over 66 times 66. So if the two variables are indeed independent, we would expect 17 non-smokers who've had an accident. This is equal to 19 over 66 times 32 over 66 times 66. 19 because there's 19 heavy smokers, 32 because there's 32 no accident people, and the 66 is because sample size is 66. 14 over 66 times 32 over 66 times 66. 33 over 66 times 32 over 66 times 66. Our observed table, our expected table. And remember, chi-squared tests are always observed minus expected, squared, over expected, and then added up. So this next step is just going to be the obs oops, one more. It's going to be equal to the observed heavy minus the expected squared divided by the expected. And copy and paste allows us to do all those calculations quickly. And then the test statistic is just going to be equal to the sum, as always, of all of those chi-squared components. 0.97241. Point nine seven. Rerun this part of the of the recording so that again you see how we got the expected. Expected again goes back to a definition of independent that we had. How we got these components of the chi squared, how we got the actual chi squared. Now we can calculate the p value. This is a chi-squared. It's a chi-squared probability, so dist. And we do want just the right tail. It takes two things, the test statistic and the number of degrees of freedom. Remember, the number of degrees of freedom is the number of rows minus 1 times the number of columns minus 1. 3 minus 1 times 2 minus 1. So the p-value is 0 0.61495, 0 0.616, considering everything, really happy that we got pretty close. And we can also calculate the critical value, and the critical value for chi-squared is going to be dot .inv, dot .rt, probability is 0 0.05, degrees of freedom again will be 2. So the critical value is essentially 6. Our test statistic is less than the critical value. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. Our p-value is greater than alpha. We fail to reject the null hypothesis. Those two conclusions will always be the same for chi-squared tests. And that's the end. Hopefully this was helpful, uh, both for problem 1 and for problem five. Chi-squared tests are very, very exciting. 
Problem 1 was a chi-squared goodness of fit test, which I use in my research quite frequently. And problem 5 was a chi-squared test of independence, which I personally don't use too frequently, but it is used very frequently to test for independence between two categorical variables. I hope this was helpful. Take care.